we get to the text of Job now. And my goal is to make it five verses. We may make it a bit further than that, but we'll see. We're at least going to try to make it five. So I'll ask uh, Jake if you would go ahead and go to Job 1. Jake with the Bible that doesn't have numbers. <laughs> you can just give me a... <laughs> hey, hey, knock that off. Uh, in fact, let me give that back to Nick. Nick, you're in charge of Job 1, 1 through 5, because I'm going to come back to it a million times, and I don't want to go to the guy with no numbers. Okay. Um, I know where it ends. So. <laughs> All right. All right. This morning, we're going to try and dig into the text of Job. And, and really, the introduction here is important because it sets the stage for so many of the characters and certainly the questions that are going to come up again and again throughout Job. So let's start by just hearing the first five verses, Job 1, through, Job 1, 1 through 5, and then we'll come back to these individually and pick several things out of them. Nick, would you read that? Yes. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continue. The story of Job, the book of Job, begins with this picture of what I think we would call a well-run world. Job begins with things from our perspective as they ought to be. In the supplementary book that we're using for our class, Chris Ash's Trusting God in the Darkness, he says a society where great persons are also good persons. What does he mean by that? What's the difference between a great person and a good person, and why does he think we would want them to be one and the same? Yeah, so that's the good person part. A good person is someone with, with integrity, a moral person. In this context, certainly a God-fearing person, a person the way Job is described, which we'll get into in a minute. And what's a great person, then, in this context? Someone that's even above all that, that's just greater than just... Not in this... In general, okay. yes. But in this context, it's actually a different category, he means. A society where great persons are also good persons. Somebody who's elevated in the society. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody yeah. who is rich, yeah. so, who is okay. powerful, yeah. who is influential. That's a great person in this yeah. context. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and what Ash says that we want and what we see in the beginning of Job is one person for whom both of those things are true. The person who has the money, the power, and the influence and is also upright and honorable, and all these things that we'll get into in a minute. And so Job begins by telling us, not Job himself, Job the book, begins by telling us about a person, Job, who is both good and great. And we should be very satisfied by this. In Hebrew, the book of Job begins with the word a man. A man there was. And it's going to be a man there was, and then all this stuff about Job. This is a story about a man. There are going to be other characters along the way, but Job is the center of attention at every part in the book. Job is either talking or thinking or being talked about or thought about. And this is the story about him. And so the writer's description of Job, everything he tells us about Job here at the beginning, is going to be critical for our understanding of a book that is about Job. And the, the description here, it's kind of easy to gloss over. Oh, yeah, Job was a really good guy. Job had a lot of stuff, but there's more to it than that. And we've got to get more into the details because this stuff is going to, we're going to have to call back in our memory on this information throughout the book. First topic, who is Job? So, uh, Job 1.1. Nick, will you read that again, just first one? 
There was a man in the land of Booz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. All right, so Job is a man, and we don't know where his hometown is, except we know it's not in the promised land. We know that Job lives outside of that world of Abrahamic promises. Um, now, he, he actually has a lot in common with Abraham in that respect, in that you know God sort of goes and gets Abraham out of nowhere and calls Abraham to himself. Abraham is a good dude, but he's a pagan good dude. And God gives him faith and calls him to himself and makes these promises and shows the covenant. And it seems as though something like that would have happened with Job, not in terms of covenant or we would know about it, but in terms of God revealing himself to him out of paganism, calling him to faith because he's outside of this chain of promise. He's not inside Israel. He's not, well, there is no Israel yet, but he's not inside the covenant. Um, he's an outsider that God has brought in, which means that Job only knows of God what God revealed to him and what Job received by faith. Job doesn't have the Pentateuch to draw upon. He doesn't have a Bible. He doesn't even have stories passed down from his family through the generations. He's not part of those generations. He is outside the promised land. The second thing we learn about Job is about his godliness. And there are several words or phrases that are used to describe the different aspects of his godliness. There's four of them. And these are the results of his faith. That's what godliness is. Godliness is the result in what you think, do, and say of what you believe. I believe, therefore, I do and say and think these things. I act this way. And when what you believe is the truth about God, and what, then what you act out, what you carry out, will be the truth about God. It will be consistent with that. And that is godliness. And so the godliness of Job is given to us in a lot of detail from the outset. The first word that's used is blameless. It's important that we understand what this word does and does not mean. Blameless in a biblical covenantal context does not mean sinless. Blameless means genuineness. Blameless means that godliness isn't a show. Blameless is the opposite of hypocrisy, is a good way to think about it. Um, for Job, the promises of God, the promise of salvation in Christ, is a pretty undetailed promise, right? Whatever God told Job, he did not reveal the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. He did not reveal, we would have no reason to believe he revealed, the incarnation of Jesus Christ as his saving plan. So as it was for Abraham, Job receives this undetailed promise from God, that God reveals himself, God promises to bless faithfulness, and Job walks in that faithfulness, and he doesn't have a lot of details. But that's how it was with Abraham. That's how it was with all of the Old Testament saints. Uh, Crystal, would you go to Genesis 15? And John, would you go to Romans 4? This language and concept of what happens to Job should be pretty familiar for us. Crystal 15, 6. He believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. What was counted as righteousness for Abraham? Belief. Belief. Job's godliness, his blamelessness are really important, but they are the working out of his faith, what he believes. The belief is the righteousness. And uh, John, will you read Romans 4, 3? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's, it's not that the way Job acts brings about God's blessing. Job acts as he believes. And the faith saved and the things that he does are the reflection of that saving faith, which has already been credited to him as righteousness. And the word blameless is commonly used in this context. Daphne, would you read, uh, go to Genesis 17? And Justin, while I'm doing that, would you go to Job 8, 17 verse 1. When Abraham 
Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. What does God call Abram to be? Blameless. blameless. What is Job? The first thing we learn about Job's behavior is that it is blameless. blameless. This is, we use the word integrity in modern terms, but most people don't know what integrity means, and so we use it in this sort of vague thing. But integrity has a very specific meaning. Integrity is based on the word integer, which is a consistent whole. Integrity is moral consistency. What you believe is what you say is what you do. That's integrity. Uh, and that's what God calls Abram to, and that's what we're told that Job practices here. So this is really a key to understanding Job, that we are introduced to him not as he's a good guy, but as he is blameless. He believes strongly and acts strongly and consistently according to that belief. Look later at what Bildad will say to Job. We're not going to get into the detail here, but Justin, if you would read Job 8, verse 20. Behold, God will not reject the blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. So Bildad, giving Job his brilliant advice, says, well, what we know is that the Lord won't reject a blameless man. So the question that that will force us to think through in that moment is, all right, what are our options? Well, one, one option is that's not true. God will reject a blameless man. That's a possibility. Seems to reject who God is, so it doesn't sound like a good possibility. The second one is Job is not actually blameless, and that's why God is rejecting him. But then in our memories, we've got to come all the way back to chapter one and say, no, Job is blameless. That was the premise on which the rest of this book was grounded. He is, a blame, he is a blameless man. Or then we're left with option three, Bildad's definition of rejected is wrong. God will not reject a blameless man. Job is blameless. God will not reject a blameless man. So the only other option is that Bildad's view of what it means for God to reject is what's wrong. And that's exactly the point that we're supposed to get to uh, when we get there in chapter 8. All throughout this book, this is going to happen again and again, no matter how many times you've read Job, no matter how well you know the book, it happens to me every single time. The further you get into the book, the more you become tempted to think that Job is not blameless. The more the friend's arguments work their weight on you and you start to think that Job is hiding some sin somewhere. <laughs> I think that Job is covering something up. And the whole point of the book beginning with this introduction, not Job talking about himself, but with our omniscient author narrator talking about Job, is to set the table stakes for this book. Job is blameless. Get that in your head. When you doubt it later, come back to this moment. Job is blameless. Really, really important. The other words that he uses to describe Job, another one is upright. Upright focuses in Hebrew on your relation toward others. Um, opposites are sometimes helpful. So if blameless is the opposite of hypocrisy, upright is the opposite of a double crosser. Somebody who you cannot trust them. Somebody who is going to look after themselves rather than honor the agreement they made or look after you. That's the opposite of upright. Upright is somebody who's honorable, somebody who is trustworthy. Uh, it is one thing for somebody to be a straight shooter. You know, that's really appreciated today. People talk, I love that guy. That guy's a, that guy's a straight shooter. He'll just give it to you straight. But a lot of straight shooting is just an excuse to be a jerk. A lot of supposed transparency is so that people don't have to practice kindness because that's a lot harder to tell the truth in love. They just want to say, well, you know, the truth, I'm just going to shoot straight with you. And, and what Job does, what this word upright is, is somebody who can pair truth and transparency with unselfishness and love. It's a really amazing combination. It is a godly combination. Some of us are really good at loving other people through kindness 
and not making them mad at us. And some of us are really good at loving other people through truth. And what they need in their life is a good truth bomb. And I'm just going to drop this thing on them and make them deal with it. And what upright is, is somebody who can marry those together. Love the person with kindness, with patience, with compassion, and tell them the truth. And that's what upright means. We're also told about Job, uh, we get a phrase that Job is one who feared God. That's the third description of Job's faith and his moral behavior. What Job is, and this is a word I'd like to reclaim, so I'd love to use it. Job is a practitioner of true religion. The word religion has really fallen out of favor in modern times, and it is such a shame. Job is a practitioner of the true religion. He's a genuine practitioner of the true religion. And where does godliness begin? Where does wisdom, this is a book about where is wisdom to be found, where does wisdom and godliness begin? Fear of God. The fear of God. And Job is one who feared God. Now let's talk about what that means. Fear means, it means fear, but let's, <laughs> let's not run away from that part of it either. But it's a complicated word, fear. It's a, it's a, it's a robust word, has a lot, of, a lot of facets. Fear in our brain should start with reverence. Fear begins by knowing our place before God. You know the story about the couple that got divorced over religious differences? He thought he was God and she disagreed. <laughs> Reverence is the recognition that he is God and we are not. And all that that means, all that should flow from that. Irreverence is when we put ourselves as equals or even higher than God. That's irreverence. That's why when we talk about things like reverent worship, what people hear when you say reverent worship is dead lifeless, serious, boring <laughs> worship. That's what people think when you say reverent. What we mean when we say reverent is worship that recognizes that he is God and that we are not. That we do not deserve to be there except his grace. And that we should not presume that he would be willing to meet with us or to bless us except on his terms. Not because he's mean, but because He's God, and we're not. That's the heart of reverent worship. We want to meet with God. We want to be beloved sons and daughters of God. We want to have close, emotional, personal intimacy with God. We just don't believe we could do that on our terms because he's God and we're not. So the way to access God is the way that God says you can access God. And all of reverence sort of flows from that. Um, awe is another good word. Submission is an important one because it's one thing to recognize that somebody is the boss over you, but it's another thing to say, therefore, I will submit to them rather than, yeah, I recognize it and no thanks <laughs> going on. So submission is a part of that, that fear of God. Why do we use the word fear then? Why don't we just get rid of the word fear? Because that makes people think about cowering and, and being afraid of what will happen to you. Well, part of the reason that we keep the word fear is, I mean, the main reason is that the Bible uses it and we don't get to throw out Bible words. But then we figure out why does the Bible use it? Everything I just said about fear is true. Reverence, acknowledgement, none of that's about sort of the scaredy cat kind of fear, right? But the scaredy cat kind of fear has to be a part of it if you take that seriously. Because what should be the emotional state of a person who says to God, you're not the boss of me? They need a little bit of fear. The person who says, I can come to you on my terms and you should just be happy that I showed up. What does that person need? A little bit of skirt in them. They need to be a little bit scared. Because read the Bible about people, especially with regards to worship, who decide, hey, God, you should be satisfied with me worshiping on my terms. Here's my strange fire. Take it or leave it. What happens? Poof. It, not just Old Testament. It didn't work out so bad for Ananias and Sapphira either. Like, you can't do this stuff. 
the Corinthians who are sick and some of them are dead. Why? Because they told God, hey, this whole Lord's Supper thing, we roll the way we want to roll. That's New Testament, you guys. That's not like mountain of fire, Old Testament. God. That is Jesus, <laughs> the spirit of Christ for his church, making people sick and dead. Why? They didn't have fear of the Lord. What the Corinthian church needed was some fear of the Lord. Because if you are on the wrong side of him, you should be scared. There is a lot there. <laughs> He's God. Andrew, do you have a question? No, I was going to answer it. Like, what fear then? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I did that. For this you probably would have been succinct, succinct too. Right? I just want to say the, the, my favorite picture of that is John, who is leaning against Jesus' bosom, and then he comes against Christ coming in his power and authority and revelation, and he falls down as one day. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's not a guy who didn't know Jesus personally and intimately. It's a guy who had that experience. And yet when you see Isaiah, we talk about it all the time. Isaiah is a pretty righteous guy. Isaiah has conceptually a vision of the holiness of God through faith. But then when he gets a legit vision of the holiness of God, he wants to be dead. It's like, this is too much. Too much God for me. <laughs> this is how people get burnt up. That's fear of the Lord. And that's what Job has. Uh, the result of that, if you believe God is God, part of your desire to serve God and to please God comes from the, the duty aspect. He created me. I'm his creature. I have a duty to serve God. But part of your obedience and desire to follow also comes from the awe of his love for you. That God, the God that made John fall over as one dead, the God who the train of his glory made Isaiah lose his mind, the God who burned up with fire the false worshipers, the God who separates the waters of the sea so that his people can pass through in safety and then crashes that stuff down on Pharaoh's armies, that God gave himself for me. That, I mean, we should be awestruck. And as a response of that all, we desire to serve and follow. Um, Job's desire is to please God. That means putting God first first in every area of life? And I think that is such a valuable question that we take for granted because we think it's trivial. But I would challenge you this week, maybe write it on a three by five card, put it on your car dashboard or on your mirror. I made it my screensaver or my wallpaper on my phone once so that every time I looked at my phone, this is what I saw. And it's the question, what would it look like to put God first right now? Because you think about the number of situations you're going to go through in a given day and in a given week where you're going to be on autopilot and you're going to do what you've always done. And maybe what you've always done is to put God first in that and God be praised. But there are plenty of situations in our life where I don't think the thing we're thinking about is what does it look like to put God first here? And that's what it is to fear the Lord. It's to put God first. Ash in his little book, I don't mean little dismissively. I mean, little like, thank you for writing a concise book. It's uh, appreciation. He says, as the book develops, we shall see that Job believed that God was both sovereign and just, that he had the power to make sure the world ran the way he chose to make it run, and that the way he would choose to make it run would be marked by, uh, would be fair and marked by justice. It's going to be really important for us to believe these things about Job. What does Job believe about God? Because the resistance that Job puts up to his friends, while Job still has this unresolved tension with God, is because of what Job believes about God. He fears the Lord. He says, I know that God has the power, so it's not a lack of power problem, and I know that God is completely holy and just, so it's not a lack of goodness or justice problem, So I, I, and I know it's not a sin problem, I'm examining myself, so your answers, friends, can't be right. And that's why he struggles so much with them, even 
while he still can't resolve the issue with God himself in his own mind, which I think is really important. Uh, Derek Thomas, in his commentary on Job, says, A person who fears God puts God first in every area of life. God is not thought of as an equal, still less an inferior, but an all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere-present God who may do with us as he wills. People who don't fear God either don't believe one of those attributes. They don't believe God knows all and can seize all. They don't believe God is sovereign and has all power. Or, because a lot of people, especially in the South, would say they believe all of that. They don't believe he does anything with it. They don't believe he's engaged in the world and in their lives. And so they believe they can do whatever they want. <clears throat> and what they need, I need, is fear of the Lord. And that's what Job had. The fourth one is that Job turned away from evil. This is such a good word picture. <laughs> Turning away from evil. That involves looking. You have to look at the paths. Stopping and reflecting on that question, what would it look like to put God first here, means looking at the options in front of you and considering them in light of righteousness. And when you see an evil path, even when you're going down the evil path already, you see it for what it is and you turn away from it. You look for the godly path and you take that one. That requires repentance. It's not in for a, a, pa in for a penny, in for a pound. It's not the sunk cost of, well, you know, I've been unrighteous this far down the path. May as well see this one through. It is, oh, God, forgive me. I shouldn't be on this path. I shouldn't be this far down this path. How do I get from here to there? And that, that willingness, the repentant heart, willing <clears throat> to change. This is uh, absolutely critical if you ever want to change your relationships. Developing this capability by the Spirit will add years to your life. Years. In your marriage, most of all, but with your children, with your family and friends, you know the number of times you go down the wrong path and you say to yourself, oh, I'm here now. Keep going. Yeah, I'm holding on to this one. Because how humiliating would it be to stop mid-sentence, mid-accusation, mid-defense of self, to stop mid-sentence and say, you know what? I'm making all of this junk up because I'm embarrassed and stubborn about my sin and don't want to admit it. I'm sorry, will you forgive me? How many years would you put back on your life if you said that and move to the other path, <laughs> the path of repentance and forgiveness instead of, man, we can go for days. We can go for weeks. I don't know about, I'm, I'm sort of a pro at this. I can go for months if I need to. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is my path. I love this path. I've known this path since I was a child. This is my path. It's my happy place. It's not my happy place. It's my comfortable, sinful place. Nothing about it is happy. And so that idea of turning away from evil, that's what Job practiced in his life. Again, so important that we understand Job is not perfect. Job is repentant. If the, if the picture were Job as a perfect man, then when we get to the middle of the book, we would know he's hiding something. We would know there is some covered up sin here that is the cause of all of this. And so the book, the introduction is very careful to lay out. Job's a repentant man. He's making offerings and sacrifices for sin and for the possibility of sin. He is a watchful man. He's looking for the evil path and turning away from it. He's not perfect. He's a believer. And that's why Ezekiel says what he says. Uh, Kathy, can you go to Ezekiel 14? Ezekiel lists out some characters of godliness. And it's easy to forget that Job is a part of this. It's Ezekiel 14, read verse 14 and then verse 20. 
Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness, declares the Lord God. And verse 20. Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, declares the Lord God, they would deliver neither <coughs> son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. So he's making the point of uh, one righteous person is not righteous enough to save a city. <laughs> no human being uh, pre-Christ possesses that level of righteousness. And so Ezekiel's thinking of the three most righteous people that everybody would know to say even they couldn't pull this off. And Job makes that list. He is a truly godly man. Now, he's godly, he's righteous, the same way anyone else is righteous, by faith. Don't forget what we read in Genesis. He is not godly because of his works. His works are godly because of his faith. Real faith lived out is that godliness. So the book is going to make us question this all throughout the text. It's going to make us doubt Job's testimony. But remember, we're not getting the testimony from Job. We're getting the testimony about Job. This is who Job is. He is a upright, blameless man who fears the Lord and turns away from evil. Job is a good man. And we're supposed to remember that. So what questions do we have about Job's faith and godliness before we dig into his greatness? That's his goodness. Then we'll talk about his greatness. So, How are we to think about how he views his kids and making sacrifices for them? Yeah, I'll come back to that. But it is an interesting... Some people consider it a shadow that Job carries around this anxiety about his kids' sin. I... I would read it a little bit differently, but I, I will talk about that. Because I, I could see being tempted later in the book to come back to that as well. His family was yeah they they were hiding something, and so God was bringing out to yeah that's not the intent of that that passage. Um, but I, I'll go through that uh, when we get to that verse. Justin, is it appropriate to aspire like how can we be like Job in this regard? One one. I think imitating Job as he imitates Christ, and I'll talk about Job as a type of Christ in just a bit, I think that is entirely appropriate. I mean, imagine your, this is not how it works, but let's just for a moment, you're looking down at your funeral and somebody's eulogy about you takes Job one through five and replaces your name and Atlanta. <laughs> no way would they put Jersey in a <laughs> eulogy like that. You know it's right. But that's, I mean, that's exactly what we'd want, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. For somebody to say these things about us because they believe they're true. Job's biographer knew these things to be true about Job. What an amazing example to follow. I just don't want to take like context it's like it's not written to me and make myself yeah insert it when that's not the literature style of it all again it's the it's the meaning is a circle right. concept the center of the circle of this passage is about job and setting up our understanding of the character of job so that when we read the rest of the book we come back to this as our anchor point for who job is but certainly within the circle of meaning and valuable application is blameless what does it mean to be blameless? I should be blameless. I believe what Job believed. I believe it with more clarity, and I've got the Holy Spirit. And he was blameless. He was blameless with one hand tied behind his back. I, I should be challenged by Job. Kathy? Um, so you're, you were talking at the beginning about the congruity between belief and actions. Yeah. So if, if our goal in, in as believers is to be transformed into the image of God, so when we see areas in our life, say impatience, is that a, is whoa, that a red whoa. flag on the dead on the dashboard to say, therefore, I have beliefs, I have faulty beliefs in that area because were my beliefs did I do if I had a true belief system, then congruently my actions would reflect that. That's right, and it may not be that we don't believe the thing itself, but there is a belief somewhere in that chain. Somewhere in there, I'm doubting. Because again, think about trustworthiness. If I'm if I'm impatient, that's, think I'm about saying, think about integrity and that moral consistency. 
Think about what it means when we say Christ-likeness. And, and people want to try to separate behavior from belief. And that way lies madness. It is absolute madness to think that you can change a behavior for the long term. Anybody can do anything for the short term. But to actually change a behavior for the long term without a consistent chain of beliefs underlying it is absolute madness. It's, it's moral insanity, and any thoughtful person about what they do will go insane going down that path because you cannot act contrary to what you believe and have peace of mind and have mental peace. And so Christ is the truth of God. What we're supposed to see in Christ is the truth of God. He's the word made flesh. I'll go through all of Psalm 119, right? All of that, Jesus made words. That's what we are to believe. If we actually believe that, what will happen to us is we will be transformed by the renewal of our minds, belief, and then as we act with integrity, the things we say and think and do will be more consistent with the things that we believe and the result is Christ likeness is that the stuff we do draw your spectrum of your life and put that little mark at glorification when you're made a renewed creature in Christ at that moment every single thing that you think say and do perfectly reflects what you believe about Christ but you don't have to wait for glorification to reap massive benefits along that spectrum. I think the hard thing to me about Job has always been is because he's all those things and yet he loses everything, right? And I think that's a hard thing. You to want say. a well-run right. world. Well, yeah. That's a hard, obviously. Here, I'm going to get there in just a minute, yeah, but okay. yes, yeah. I think that's what a lot that of That is the tension. Especially if you're ever dealing with sort of unbelievers or just coming new into Christianity. Yeah, because yeah. that's the that's the why am I doing this stuff? Yeah. And that's the argument Satan is going to bring against Job. The only reason Job yeah. practices godliness is because it produces good results. And Job asked the question, what if it didn't? What if it didn't? What if you did everything right and you lost it all? Why'd you bother doing everything right? And Job's answer is, because God is still God. Yeah. Jake? On that belief, yeah. Um, I, I, just, I assume we have to think about it kind of like the analogy of the, the waves coming up. Because you, you have that aha moment. But then you don't always... It's not a straight line. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sanctification, uh, oh, that it were, a straight, consistent yeah. line up from here to glory. No, we, we go down the wicked path. We believe, help my unbelief. We forget the things God has said. And we have false beliefs that need to be corrected and shaped by the word. And we act consistently with false belief and sin comes from that. And then we also have true beliefs that something in the middle is getting muddled up and we act inconsistently with the thing that we say that we really believe. And there's a lot of work to be done in us. And we live in a sin-stained world and we got thorns and, and thistles and all of this problem. It's very complicated, but if you zoom out, it is absolutely the case that from the moment someone is placed in Christ by faith, by a work of God, until the moment someone is perfected in Christ by a work of God, a glorification, the same God who we trust 100% to have done both those works says he does this work in between that makes us more and more like Christ as we abide in Christ. And when we say things like, I just had this discussion this week with somebody, and they're coming from a brokenhearted place. I'm not meaning to, to criticize them. But when they say things like, that will never change. My push when I have to be a little aggressive on that point is, you're either saying that God is weak or that God is a liar. That God won't change you or that God can't. So let's figure out which of those two you believe. And it's almost always won't. People in the church believe God can. They just don't believe he will. That's 
So then you get compassionate again, because boy, do we need to be compassionate with that. Which one of us hasn't looked at a situation and said, God doesn't love me enough to do that. And that's Job's going to have a lot of those moments too. Let's talk about his uh, greatness. We've talked about his goodness, which by which we mean moral goodness. And in the context that we're using it here in this book, his greatness answers the question, what would you expect to happen to a man like Job? A man who is blameless and upright and turns away from evil and does right by others. What would you expect to happen to such a man? Nick, would you read verses two and three again? From one? Job yes. One? Okay. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. The description of Job conveys money and power. It's success. Scripture is obviously not concerned about the connection between Job's godliness and his wealth. It sees no contradiction here that someone that good could have this much and be this great. It says Job was among the greatest of the people in his day. There's no suggestion that he had acquired this through ungodly means or in any way involving sin. His friends will suggest this later. But here at the beginning, his wealth and power and success are connected to his goodness. And that's the way we want the world to be. To Pam's point, that's exactly how we want a well-run world. Now, prosperity is not the problem. Uh, you know, 1 Timothy 6. The love of money is a sin problem. And if I were rewriting the Bible, God would strike me dead. I might have to remove you here in a second. <laughs> so if I were writing the study Bible, I would put in the footnote here, the love of money, footnote, more than God, more than people more than holiness. The problem is not too much love for money. The problem is replacing love for those other things with love of money, demoting love of those other things to love of money. It's, an idol again. it's not about the amount of money. If you have that much, you are destined to love money. <laughs> it's what do you love money more than? I love money more than people. I love it. It's the idol. Money is my safety net. That's why I love it. What's the worst thing that could happen to me when I got all this money? Right? I'll fix it. I'll buy a new one. You know? I'll have that guy knocked off. Wait, I mean. Just... <laughs> there are plenty of dangers to watch out for. Let me let me shout out some passages. Y'all turn there and then we'll kind of read them together. Uh, Luke 8:14. Lauren, would you go to Luke 8? Kathy, would you go to 1 Timothy 5? Andrew, would you go to 2 Timothy 3? Jake, would you go to Ecclesiastes 2? And Renee, would you go to 1 Timothy? Never mind, I just did 1 Timothy 3. Wait. <laughs> there are, you always have to teach both sides of the scale on this, because some Christians are really burdened by this potential connection of money to sin. And so you have to say all the things I just said. Money's not the problem. The amount of money is not the problem. What you do with your money, as long as it's not sinful, is not the problem. All that's really important. But there are some of us who also get a little cozy with money and forget about the dangers inherent in it. And the Bible does list out some real dangers to be on the watch for. Uh, Luke 8.14, did you read that? And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who fear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. Self-indulgence and greed choke out the word of God in our lives. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, 5 through 7. She who is truly a widow left all alone has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. 
but she who is self-indulgent is dead while she lives. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. This one always really strikes me because we're talking about widows. And so you have all of the sympathy in your brain for widows. And Paul says, yes, be generous and helpful to the widows unless if they are filled with self-indulgence and greed, they got to work that out. Don't coddle that. You're like, whoa, whoa, hey, Paul, we're a little, whoa, right, but it's, it's serious stuff. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. You hear all that got lumped in there, self-indulgence and greed, worldliness. Money can facilitate our participation in those sins. And so we have to look at money carefully even as we enjoy it. Uh, when Paul talks in 1 Timothy 3 about the leaders of the church, he says they should not be lovers of money, which is a good sort of careful description of money's not the problem. It's, it's that love that changes your behavior. The, the, the money dictates what you're going to do rather than what you can do. It dictates rightness rather than God dictating rightness. Um, that's a good description of the potential problem. We serve our loves. What do we love? Do we love God? We serve God and we may use money to serve God. But if we love money, what do we serve? Well, we serve the money. We serve ourselves. We don't serve God. Another one that's easy to forget is a potential sin of money. And for some of, some of us, this is ludicrous because the idea, uh, it requires a lot of money to have this particular problem. But by and large, we live in a culture where a lot of us have a lot of money, especially compared to the rest of the world. So it's important not to forget this potential sin, too. Jake, will you read Ecclesiastes 2? It's probably the first pericope. It's 1 through 11. Oh, you have numbers. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it and behold, all was vanity, and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. We don't think about the possibility of boredom and disgust even related to money, do we? But he says he had it all. He had it all. Everything you could think of. Everything that would make you happy. I bought it. I bought two, just to make sure the first one didn't break. I bought it all. And what was his attitude in the end toward the things God had made and given him? It's a big deal. A shrug of the shoulders, right? It makes us so mad when we uh, see this in, most often we see it in children, like the ingratitude of the value of something. Take a kid to Disney. I'm just theoretically. <laughs> and you're standing in this world of wonders and the kid is mad that you said no to the Mickey ice cream. <laughs> 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 He's 
It's not about the ears. Scripture, yeah. <laughs> scripture pours scorn, as Derek Thomas says. Scripture pours scorn on the wrong use of wealth, not the mere possession of it. Does any of this describe Job? No. 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 Chapter 1 doesn't give us the faintest hint that any of this describes Job. He's generous with his loved one. I think Job had read Joe Rigney's The Things of Earth. He knew how to enjoy God's good gifts. He knew how to worship God through the use of the good things that God offered and provided. And so uh, that's the way we're supposed to understand Job. Wealth is not necessarily a problem. You do have to watch out for these things. Look at Job's life. Nope, wealth is not the problem. Power is not the problem. Popularity is not the problem. We can't, we can't read all of this prosperity section as a cause and effect from Job's behavior. God makes some rich and some poor for his purposes. He makes some politically powerful and some politically insignificant for his purposes. Purposes. Remember, when we're reading about all the animals and all of the numerical blessing, we're reading the greatness section, not the goodness section. The goodness section is what tells us whether Job is good. So you're on dangerous ground if you look at the situation of somebody's life, the circumstances, and you try to reason their goodness from the measure of their greatness. His friends will attempt this in just a bit. It is a big mistake. Um, but when somebody has both, we like it. We think that's a well-run world. We think this is the way that things ought to be. Good men like Job should achieve greatness. It's certainly more deserved than wicked men obtaining greatness or a great man like Job living in squalor and having nothing. And we like the way this world is run. Money, power, family, respect, and then genuine goodness on top of it. He's blameless and he's upright. And that's the painting of Job. I'm going to stop there for this morning and then we'll pick up at this point next week. We'll get into uh, John's questions as we get the verse about his relationships and the things happening with his children. But questions about goodness and greatness. Sometimes I, I wrestle with uh, seek first the kingdom of God uh, with the world competes based on power and money and things like that. So what I'm trying to say is if a Christian is in a powerful position and is trying to, you know, seek the kingdom of God, is one of the means of doing that, yeah, like trying to seek power or seek money so they can be an influential Christian in the worldly system? Yes. Recognizing the trappings on both sides. And some people will use the language of look at all the things I could do for the kingdom to justify selfish pursuits. Fundamentally, people can use that for an unjustifies the means argument. Right? I could make this church significantly bigger and more influential in Atlanta. All I would have to do is change everything about the way we worship and what I preach. But wouldn't we have more influence? And then we could get to know people one on one, and then we could like have a secret version of the truth that we were growing people from the bed. Like, you, you see how crazy that can get? Now, by the same token, there are plenty of Christians who, insecure in the station in which God has placed them, they look at everybody with a bigger congregation or more influence or whatever else and say, that person must have compromised. They must be in it for selfishness. Because if you're really serving God, everybody hates you, and it's me and thee, and I'm not so sure about thee. Right? Like, you can fall off both sides of that. But it is absolutely true that God can put faithful God-honoring Christians in positions of influence and use them for those purposes. And they can be seeking first the kingdom of God. And what's the back end of that verse? All these things will be added. It doesn't say seek first the kingdom of God because nobody likes that other stuff anyway. It says seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added. Don't seek those things. Seek the kingdom of God and God will add what he adds. Jesus flipped the paradigm of power, right? Like he could have come with angels and you know killed the people. He could have gotten off the cross. So that's sort of like the underlying of. of if he were interested in an earthly kingdom, but as I'll say to Pilate next week, he didn't do that because he didn't primarily do that because he was committed to a different method. He did it because he was primarily committed to a different kingdom. You don't build a spiritual kingdom of the church 
by deposing the Roman government. You, you do it by deposing Satan. <laughs> and so he was very focused on Satan and conquered. And that conquering looked different. All right, last question. Yeah, we gotta get... quick, 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 quick. Does the Bible teach that the world should be well run? I don't know. That's why we got to read Job. <laughs> <laughs> and is and is no. that is that really no. is that really a well run world, right. or is it our our interpretation, our, ex what world, our expectation, yeah, yeah, the right. world we would run? run. Right. We should keep right. reading Job. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. We're done. <laughs>